Welcome everyone to this year's, uh, to this week's colloquium, uh, CS colloquium. We're very happy to have Yuval Kochman with us. So Yuval is a professor here at uh, the Hebrew University since 2012. He has done his PhD and master's degrees in Tel Aviv University, and he was a postdoctoral researcher at MIT. Uh, his the main research uh, area is information theory, signal processing, and communication. And I guess today he'll tell us some re recent exciting work. Go ahead, Yuval. The stage is yours. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure to talk uh, in this forum. I think the last time I did that was nine years ago. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to use the new uh, Zoom room. Om almost... Uh, almost the same pleasure as to, to uh, talk in front of you physically. Uh, does the screen sharing work fine? Do you see? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about some fundamental bounds in joint sort channel coding, which is my favorite sub area of information theory. Uh, I'll explain what uh, this is. Uh, it's based in part on some uh, uh, new results I have with uh, our own uh, Ordentlich and with Yuri Poliansky from MIT. Uh, but it will be kind of a tutorial talk, so we'll get to the new stuff uh, only towards the end. Uh, so in, in information theory, we have two basic settings uh, that we mostly deal with. One is communication. So we have a message that we want to convey to someone that is uh, in a different place. Uh, and we have a noisy channel and we want that someone to be able to decode the message reliably. Uh, and the other is compression. Uh, so we have uh, some uh, source with some statistics and we want to store it uh, in, a, in some uh, memory and want to take as, uh, as less space as possible from that memory. And, and these two are known as channel coding and source coding respectively, right? So joint source channel coding will be the combination of both. Now in channel coding, uh, the most, in the most basic setting, um, a memoryless channel is just some conditional distribution. Let's call it W of Y given X. Uh, so to that channel, when we give uh, a, an input vector X, we get an output vector Y according to a product distribution uh, of uh, W. Uh, so let's say that the encoder has a message of length K bits. That's what uh, we want to convey. Uh, it translates it to, uh, to a vector of n channel inputs, x, uh, sorry, um, how do I go back, uh, wait, uh, uh, mm. So, yes, um, so it, uh, it translates it to a vector of n uh, channel inputs. Uh, the channel uh, applies the, the probabilistic law and we have n channel outputs. Uh, and the decoder needs to guess the message or to estimate the message uh, from these channel outputs. Um, a code is, the, is a collection of all of the channel inputs for these uh, possible messages. And the way we mitigate noise is that only a few input sequences are valid. So the uh, decoder knows that the input was only uh, one of the possible code words and not all of the uh, vectors uh, xn. And we define the rate to be k over n. So that's the number of bits uh, divided by the number of channel uses. So that's how many bits I was able to convey each time that I used the channel. Uh, and the famous channel coding theorem says that uh, if k grows, so I, I take uh, n and k 
um, to infinity together, I keep the rate fixed. So uh, reliable communication is possible if the rate is smaller than some quantity called the channel capacity, and it is not possible if it is greater than the channel capacity. Um, for example, maybe the most uh, simple channel is the binary symmetric channel. So in that case, X and Y are binary and X is flipped with probability P uh, independently of what X was. I can also write this uh, as in an additive form. So I can say that Y equals X plus Z where this is modulo two addition and Z is Bernoulli P independent of P. Uh, the channel capacity is one minus the binary entropy function of P or the binary entropy function is written here. So this capacity is one bit when P is zero. So if the channel doesn't do anything bad, each time uh, I place a bit at the input, I'll get a bit at the output. Uh, it deteriorates as P grows. And when P is uh, one half, then the channel capacity is zero. This is because uh, in that case, Y becomes statistically independent of X. So the decoder has uh, no knowledge of what the encoder did. It grows back towards uh, P equals one because the decoder can always flip the outputs. Um, the other basic famous uh, channel uh, is the additive Gaussian noise channel. So here uh, X and Y are uh, all the reals and y equals the real addition of x and z, where z is Gaussian uh, with some variance uh, n. Uh, we have an input power constraint. So we say that the, uh, that the second norm of the vector x cannot be more than n times p. Uh, this is since uh, if there is no such con constraint, uh, channel capacity will be infinite, but that's like saying that uh, if I'm at a class, uh, I, can I can convey information to the students, uh, no matter how much noise they make by just shouting uh, uh, louder, but that's of course impossible because my throat is uh, limited, so that's the same kind of thing. Uh, and uh, you, you can define the uh, channel signal to noise ratio, or SNR, that's the ratio of P to N. So that's the power uh, of the transmitter divided by the power of the noise. And the fa famous uh, formula says that channel capacity is half log one plus SNR. So if you look at the, at the graph, then after the initial bit of part, uh, if I'm going to high enough SNR, then when I look at the X axis in, in a log scale, then channel capacity behaves uh, linearly. So these are the two uh, basic examples and we'll keep these as running examples throughout the talk. And now let's look at the source coding uh, counterparts. So a memory source is defined by some uh, scalar distribution and the probability that I get uh, a specific uh, source sequence is the product uh, distribution induced. Uh, in this case, uh, I get a source vector of length k, and now the encoder translates it into n bits to be stored in a memory. Uh, now, uh, if, if, if I have enough bits, I could store uh, the, the source in a way that it can be recovered with high probability. But if I, if I have less bits, if I want to compress more, then I get to a regime uh, known as lossy compression. Uh, so I'm going to store um, the source in a way that when I reproduce it, I only get an approximate reconstruction, not the exact source. This is what's used, for example, for uh, uh, voice, audio, or uh, video compression, right? As opposed to text compression. Uh, so if I want to say that the reconstruction is close to the source, uh, I need to define in what sense it is close. So we define a distortion measure. So uh, this is a function from sequ source sequences and reconstruction sequences to the reals. Uh, and uh, we take an additive measure that is, 
the distortion between two sequences is just the average of the distortion between elements. So this the uh, average of uh, the distortion between SI and SI hat. Um, and so this D will be now a scalar, a function of two scalars. Again, I can define a rate. Now the rate will be the number of bits that I use per source sample. And the loss according uh, theorem says uh, that if K grows and I keep this rate fixed, so I keep the ratio between N and K fixed, then I can get reconstruction with expected distortion D if the rate is greater than some, uh, some uh, quantity known as the rate distortion function, and it is impossible if it's smaller. Uh, let's look at the two uh, examples that are parallel to the channels we took. So uh, if I have the binary source and the binary reconstruction, and let's say that the source is uh, uniform, so that source is just IAD Bernoulli one half, and they take the Hamming distortion measure. So uh, if, uh, if some bit was reconstructed uh, correctly, the distortion is zero. If it was flipped, the distortion is one. Uh, under this, the rate distortion function is given by one minus the entropy or the binary entropy of the distortion. So this is just the formula that we had for the binary symmetric channel. Uh, the other case, um, in the Gaussian case, so now I have a real source, a real reconstruction. Uh, let's say the source is normal Gaussian uh, with zero mean and some variance, sigma squared. And I take the distortion measure to be uh, the square distortion. So the square distance between uh, the source and reconstruction. Uh, and so now uh, I can define, similar to the SNR, I can define the signal to distortion ratio. So that's the ratio of the source variance to the mean squared error. And uh, the rate distortion function is given by half log of this uh, SDR, which is uh, very similar to our uh, formula for the Gaussian channel capacity, uh, except for the one plus, which appears uh, in channel capacity, but we won't worry about this uh, one plus. This is just a matter of uh, uh, biased versus unbiased uh, estimation. Okay, so now what is the joint source channel problem? So in the joint source channel problem, I have a source and I have a channel. So I have K samples of the source and I have N uses of the channel and I have an encoder and decoder, and I want to, uh, to be able to reconstruct the source of the decoder. Uh, and again, uh, I'm measuring the distortion between the source and the reconstruction. So notice that in this formulation, I have no rate uh, in, in, the, um, in the separate source and channel problems. I had the notion of rate, which was uh, the ratio between, uh, let's say, the uh, number of source samples and the number of bits. But here I have no bits at all. Uh, these S, K, Y, and S hat, maybe, for example, all uh, reals, right? So, so there is no uh, inherent um, notion of rate here. The encoder is just any function from source sequences of length k to channel inputs of length n. Um, this problem, you can think of many practical settings where it arises. Uh, for example, I take a photo with my uh, phone and I want to send it to someone else. Right? So um, my goal is that someone else sees the photo. I don't care uh, about storing the photo on a digital memory. I don't care about um, uh, sending the source through some modem. Uh, this is all a black, a black box for me. Uh, I, have, uh, I have the pixels at the input, which are reals. I have the pixels at the output, which are reals. Uh, and in the middle, I have the wireless channel where I have real, uh, let's say, uh, the voltage that I produce on some antenna, right? So everything is uh, real numbers. There is nothing digital in the problem formulation. 
And still, uh, when you ask what is the optimal performance, then bits uh, suddenly appear. So uh, we can define the row to be n over k. So now this is the uh, number of channel inputs that I have per source sample. Uh, and I, now I fix this uh, row and I take k and n together to infinity. And then uh, Shannon tells us uh, that the optimal distortion, optimal expected distortion that I can get uh, can be computed by solving the equation R of D equals rho, equal, rho times C. So uh, the ray distortion function and the channel capacity, which are both uh, digital entities, they're both related to bits, appear uh, as a solution to this problem that has no bits in it. Um, and here is the reason. So now I show you one possible scheme that's optimal. And uh, the scheme goes like this. Uh, I'm going to take my source and I'm going to compress it as if there was no channel. Right, so now uh, I have at the digital interface at the encoder, I have some bits. Now uh, I'm forgetting at all that I had uh, a source and I'm saying, oh, I have bits. But in the communication problem, we already learned how to convey bits to the other side. So I'm going to apply some communication code and get these bits with very small error probability get them reliably on the other side. So I have digital data at the decoder. And then again, I can forget that there was ever a channel because these are the same bits uh, that were the output of the compression scheme. And I can have a source decoder and a reconstruction. And what I need to do here, I need to decide upon Okay, so for, for the source, I need to apply an optimal code, the code that uh, approaches the uh, ray distortion function. For the channel, I need to apply um, an optimal code, the code that approaches the channel capacity, and uh, they need to agree on the rates in order for the digital interface to work. So if, uh, for example, if I take rho equals one and R of D is less than C, then I can always have some rate that is between the ray distortion function and the channel capacity. And this will be the, um, the rate of this digital interface. So that's great. Uh, why is it great? Well, first, there is a separation of architectures and of engineers. Uh, in practice, channel coding and source coding are arts, especially source coding. You need to take care of all kinds of uh, correlations that you have in a video and so on. Uh, and so now you can say mm, the, uh, the engineer that, um, that builds the modem doesn't need to care uh, if, he, if he's uh, transmitting data that was created by a video or by text or by anything. Um, this is compatible with digital storage, right? Um, uh, probably when I send my uh, photo, I, own, I also want to store it. So I need to uh, translate it into bits anyway. And I can use uh, 50 years, or, sorry, 70 years of uh, research in digital communications and coding. So this is great. And as we said, uh, this is optimal in the sense that uh, in the limit uh, of of uh, infinite k, I can't do any better. Uh, proving that it, it is optimal uh, comes uh, through the data processing equality. Uh, we won't get into that now. Okay, so if separation is so great, uh, why do I want to talk about joint source channel coding? So joint source channel coding would be anything that is not separation. Any uh, scheme that I will uh, put here that doesn't have a source part, a channel part, and a digital interface between them. So there are two main reasons that people, why people care about joint social channel coding. One is robustness. 
So uh, if the quality of the channel is not known a priori, for example, I don't know in a binary symmetric channel what is going to be the probability that the channel flips my bits, or I don't know what is the noise variance uh, in a Gaussian channel, then separation uh, may be suboptimal. And the second issue is delay and complexity. So um, we only said that separation is optimal in the limit that k goes to infinity. Uh, we didn't specify what uh, algorithms will be used. Maybe uh, I can have uh, a simpler scheme and the scheme that has no delay, that uh, works sample by sample, if I use something that is not uh, separation. And okay. here's an example showing that you can actually do something uh, nice. So let's take the binary joint source channel uh, problem. So I'm just combining the binary source with the Hemming distortion that we presented with the binary symmetric uh, channel mm -hmm. and then taking row equals one. So I, I can use the channel exactly one time per each source sample. So the optimum is given by R of D equals C because row equals one. Uh, now- uh, Yuval, this, Yuval? Yuval? Yeah. Uh, I have a, a humble question. Yeah, sure. Um, the lecture is quite fast and I'm not following all the details and some people uh, feel the same. Can you take three minutes to um, summarize the content so far? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so we, we, we said the following. We said if I have digital data that I want to send somewhere, right? So I translate this into channel inputs. I have some channel. This produces channel outputs. And then I can translate it back into the data, same data with high probability. And this is, this is communications. This is a modem. I have bits at home. I want to send them some someplace sales. Uh, I send them over, over the modem to the internet. The, the second problem is uh, when I have uh, some source, let's say video, and I want to store it on a memory. So what do I do? I turn the source into digital data, right? And now, on the other side, I take this digital data and uh, I reconstruct reconstruction, right? I, I, I have here an estimate of the source. And as I said, if I want, if I want this uh, digital data to be uh, small enough, then uh, this reconstruction will not be uh, equal to the source, not even with high probability, it will be something similar to the source. For example, uh, similar in a mean squared error sense, right? Uh, but now we said, let's say that I combine the two problems. So I don't care about digital data. I have the source and I have the channel and I want the reconstruction, right? So one thing they can do is follow this uh, path, take the source, turn it into digital data. Now, the digital data I identified as the digital data of this problem. Now, it goes through this. I get here the same data. And now with the decoder, I can get a reconstruction. And it turns out that this approach if I look at very um, uh, long chunks of this source, then this is optimal. So uh, by, uh, by doing this separation, so by uh, taking the optimal solution for the source problem and optimal solution for the channel problem, just putting them together, 
I'm going to get the optimal distortion. So the optimal expected uh, distance between, let's say, mean squared error between my source and my reconstruction. But uh, there are other things I could do because in this problem definition, there was no digital data. I just introduced it. The, in the problem definition, I could take uh, any mapping from the uh, source sequences to the channel inputs. Uh, and, and then I asked, okay, so why do we uh, want to do something else? And the, the, chan the, the channel is, is, is actually physical, right? The, the channel is physical, yeah. This is uh, from uh, one antenna to the other antenna. But we can model it, for example, uh, saying that what the channel does is add Gaussian noise. That, that would be a very simple channel. Uh, and, the, and the source is, is physical too. Uh, so, that's, so that's the issue. In this problem, there's a, a physical source, a physical channel, and there are no bits in the problem definition. Right? Uh, so uh, what, um, so why do people uh, want to do things that are not wh what I pointed out here, that do not introduce this digital data in the middle? Uh, one reason is uh, that they may uh, want to be able to, uh, they want a scheme that will be flexible, that will be robust to, to uh, varying channel conditions. That, so that I don't know the channel conditions uh, in advance. And uh, second reason is that I want something that will be simpler and work on uh, shorter blocks. And now I'm giving an example where a very simple scheme can be optimal and robust. And the example is the following. I have a binary source, so these are just my source are just uh, bits that are um, Bernoulli one half. And uh, my channel is a binary symmetric channel. So this channel, in this case, the channel is not over the reals. The channel also uh, accept binary inputs and outputs. And, the bi and, the, and this channel flips uh, each bit that it gets with probability P. And uh, since we said that the optimal uh, distortion can be found by equating R of D to C, and I just substitute the uh, expressions that we know for the ray distortion functions and the channel capacity, the, um, the solution says that for the optimal scheme, the expected distortion, so that's the expected probability uh, that the bits here at the reconstruction are different than the bits here at the source equals exactly the probability that the channel flips a bit. This is for the optimal uh, for the optimal scheme. But then I can have just the following very simple scheme. I take the source. I take one source bit. I just fit it into the channel without doing anything. And here I will get the reconstruction without doing anything. So my, uh, my encoder is identity function. My encoder just takes one symbol of the source and pushes it into the channel. And also my decoder doesn't do anything. My decoder takes the channel output and says, okay, this is the reconstruction. Right. So instead of this um, of, of a scheme that used uh, optimal uh, channel codes and optimal source codes, both of, uh, of uh, high complexity of, uh, of length that goes to infinity, instead of all of this, I can do nothing at all. I can, I can just apply identity and get the same result. So uh, this is first very simple, right? I don't need to build any hardware or software or anything. Uh, second, there is no delay. So if this uh, source is being generated and I'm now, I know, I'm shooting a video, uh, then uh, for each 
uh, sample that I take for each pixel, I just send that pixel without waiting for the next pixels and it can be reconstructed in the other end. So it's zero delay. And uh, it's completely robust to the channel conditions. I don't know, I don't need to know what is the channel uh, law or what is the probability that the channel will flip a bit. Because in, in any case, I'm doing nothing. I'm just sending the source as it is, right? So this um, trivial mapping is always optimal. Uh, and in the Gaussian example, we get something very similar. If we compare the ray distortion function to the channel capacity, when uh, the source is Gaussian, we care about the mean squared error distortion and the channel is additive uh, Gaussian noise channel, um, then equating the ray distortion function with the capacity says just that the uh, SDR equals one plus SNR. Um, so this means, uh, again, the, now uh, what I need to do in the encoder is just multiply by some real number at the decoder, I'll, I'll just multiply by some other real number, which is the optimal uh, MSE estimator, uh, and, that, and that's it. So again, uh, the encoder doesn't need to know um, the channel signal-to-noise ratio because all it does is it multiplies by, um, by the ratio between the uh, square root of the ratio between uh, the channel input power and the source variance. So in these very two very simple examples, we see that we can do something very simple that is uh, optimal uh, under all conditions. Um, but what about more general cases? So these uh, examples are very tailored. So I took uh, binary with binary, Hemming with Hemming, Gaussian with Gaussian, um, and so on. Uh, um, MSC with power constraint. Uh, and it turns out that really uh, you need to really tailor um, your problem for this to happen. Uh, it, do it, it, it doesn't happen in, in the real world. Um, but, but then what joint search channel coding asks is, okay, you can't get uh, optimal robustness and uh, zero delay, but can you still get something, right? Uh, so uh, now we'll look at the two issues uh, separately, at the issue of robustness and at the issue of uh, delay. So for, for robustness, uh, Let's look at the following uh, plot. So uh, on my x-axis, I have a log of the signal to noise ratio of the, uh, of the, so of the channel, sorry. And on the y-axis, uh, I have log of the signal to distortion ratio uh, of the source. And my solution to... Uh, to R of D equals rho C, which is half log SDR equals half times rho log one plus SNR. If I neglect the one plus because SNR is high enough, then in log scale, I have this uh, red line, which is just a straight line with slope rho. Uh, so this would be the optimal performance of, of a scheme that knows um, the SNR in advance. So I know what is the channel signal to noise ratio, so, which means I know what is the noise variance, and I just uh, design an optimal scheme for that. Now, what, what would a separation scheme do? In a separation scheme, we had this uh, digital data part. Th this digital data part works with some number of bits. I need to uh, decide in advance what is this number of bits, or in other words, I need to decide 
what is the rate in which I work. Uh, so I decide on some rate. Let's say that this is the rate there in the middle where the black uh, meets the red. So uh, uh, this rate is the channel capacity for some signal-to-noise ratio. What happens if the signal-to-noise ratio is better than that? The um, thing is that I don't improve. Why don't I improve? Because I have a compression scheme. The compression scheme works with some rate and uh, I could already decode correctly with some signal-to-noise ratio. So the fact that I have uh, a signal to noise ratio that is even higher says, fine, it's, it, it doesn't hurt me, but it doesn't help me, right? Because error probability went to zero anyway. Uh, what happens if the signal to noise ratio is worse than what I assumed? If it's worse than what I assumed, then the channel code is going to fail with high probability. So the decoder does, uh, is not going to know anything. So the, So my signal to distortion ratio is going to be terrible. I'm not going to see anything. This is sort of like what you get in digital TV, right? In nowadays TV, either you see a very good signal or you see a blue screen, right? There is nothing in between. So this is the step function of the, uh, of the uh, black curve. But those of us who are uh, old enough to remember analog TV, you know, uh, we had an antenna and we wanted to to watch, I don't know, the Jordanian channel. Uh, and if the antenna wasn't very well uh, positioned, we would see the screen with some snowflakes, right? So we would still get to see something, right? If the channel is not good, if, the, if we have too much noise, we, we would not get a blue screen. We would still see something, even though it's not with very good quality. Uh, so that's what we would like to see. We would like to see that if we have a very good channel, then our uh, channel quality improve. Then our uh, sorry, then uh, the probability that <clears throat> then the quality of the video that we watch on TV gets better. And if the channel is a bit worse, we have more noise. Uh, then the pro then uh, the quality gets worse but we still see something. So we would like to, to get some curve that is closer to the red than uh, to the black. And um, these two uh, blue curves are examples for So we want something that where uh, the signal to distortion ratio uh, improves yes. the the with the signal to noise ratio. Yeah. Sorry, so, uh, is someone asking or just left? Okay. Um, so some schemes uh, exist. They are called hybrid digital analog. Uh, I think uh, I don't have time to go into details, but I will say that some uh, schemes exist. For example, you can have schemes that achieve the uh, blue line over here. Uh, so they will, if rho is greater than one, they will improve with slope uh, one instead of slope rho. So this is somewhere between the ideal and what separation gives us. Um, there is um, uh, a very nice uh, work by Resnick, Feder, and Zamir uh, that says the following for the Gaussian channel. It says that if you want to be optimal for some signal to noise uh, ratio, so let's say that in this uh, point where uh, blue, red, and black meet, uh, you're optimal, then above this point, you, you cannot improve with a slope that is greater than one. So in a sense, you cannot be better than the blue line. Uh, this uh, result is a bit limited because it says uh, if you want to be optimal at some um, signal to noise ratio and it doesn't say what will happen if you're, if you're willing to give up there a little. Uh, and uh, 
Okay, uh, I, will, uh, I will skip this. Um, and and uh, for what we are going to show in the new work, we're, we're actually uh, using the same bounding technique uh, that was used by Resnick et al, but in a different sense, in a very uh, localized sense. So we're saying the following. Uh, let's say that uh, you know approximately what your signal to noise ratio is going to be. So you have some SNR zero and you'll have either SNR zero plus epsilon or minus epsilon. Um, so in that case, if you, let, let's say that you knew in advance that you're going to have uh, plus epsilon or minus epsilon, then also you would have the optimal SDRs such that the average of the optimal SDRs is about the optimal average SDR. But uh, if you don't know that in advance, uh, if you're going to have uh, to plan one scheme that is going to work in both the uh, SNR zero minus epsilon and SNR zero plus epsilon, then your average SDR will be significantly lower. So you're trying to, um, you're trying uh, to gain order of epsilon, but also because you're using a single scheme for the two channel conditions, you're also losing order of epsilon. And this is the uh, results that we will lose, use uh, later. Okay, so in order to, to, get, to get to the second part, let's talk about uh, delay. So that was the second issue that I said where joint social coding comes into play. Uh, I would like to use uh, codes of a shorter block length. Um, so there's the question of how do I uh, measure distortion as a function of block length? Uh, the distortion is a random variable. So uh, uh, I'm getting a specific realization of the source and a specific realization of the channel. And for these two realizations, I get some distortion, let's say some mean square distance between the source and reconstruction. But you can think of two schemes uh, where for some realizations, one will be better for others, uh, the second will be better. And in particular, if you, uh, if you plot the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of, uh, of your uh, distortion, this will be the CDF, you'll get, for one scheme, you'll get this CDF, and for another scheme, you'll get this CDF, right? So in that case, there is no clear way to say which scheme is better, right? Because no CDF uh, dominates the other. So people have looked at uh, different things. Um, what was most uh, common is to look at uh, what's called excess distortion probability. This is a formulation that is a bit like uh, PEC learning. It says, uh, if you're above some distortion, we call it an error and we, we uh, study the probability uh, to go beyond uh, that uh, threshold. Uh, now I can trash this uh, approach because I already, I, I also had uh, something to do with it. So I can feel free to trash it now and say that something that uh, is much more natural is to ask about expected distortion. So uh, we, we know we have this star, this is the expected distortion for infinite block length. This is the solution to R of D equals rho times C. And I can ask for the best scheme, what is uh, the difference? What is the, what, what is the difference between the expected distortion of a scheme that takes K source samples uh, to that uh, ideal infinite block length uh, distortion? So let's call this difference, let's call it delta K star. 
This is a quantity that will go to zero. It's non-negative. It goes to zero as k goes to infinity. And the question is how fast can it go to zero? So in the two toy examples uh, that we gave, the quantity was zero for, for all k that were at least one, because with a scalar scheme, I could already achieve uh, the optimum. Uh, now there are cases, uh, many cases where you can see that this uh, uh, goes down as uh, log of k over k. And that led me personally to believe and to uh, want to prove uh, that indeed in general, it is order of log of k over k. Uh, but then our friend uh, Orr and Yuri helped me uh, realize that actually uh, this is not the case. And we were able to prove um, that sometimes uh, it is at least order of uh, one over square root of k. So uh, this is a very pessimistic result. It, it means that I have to go to very long block lengths in order to, uh, to be at the optimum sometimes. Uh, and here, here is our example for the bad case. Uh, our example is just the same binary example where we said earlier that we can have the ideal performance. Uh, so the source is binary symmetric, uh, the channel is binary symmetric, and the distortion is hemming. But uh, uh, it was ideal for rho equals one, and now we take rho greater than one. So say that I have uh, one and a half or two channel uses per each source sample. Uh, so for this uh, example, we can show that the uh, um, that the expected distortion uh, doesn't decay that fast, and I'll say a bit about uh, the proof. Uh, so um, as as I said, it's um, it's convenient to look at the channel as an XOR with a noise sequence. So for each uh, channel input, the channel input is X and it is XORed with, the, with Z, which is Bernoulli P, and here I get Y. Um, so, I, so I do this N times, so I have a sequence ZN, and this sequence is going to have some Hemming weight. Now the expected Hemming weight is uh, p times n, but empirically I will get a different weight, right? I can get a weight that is uh, higher or lower. Uh, given some weight, then the noise sequence that I get is uniform over all of the permutations because they're because of uh, symmetry. So I can define the fu the function psi of l to be the expected distortion given some L. So this is given some difference between the weight of the sequence and the expected weight. Uh, and I can, uh, and then I can use uh, iterated expectation to say that I condition on the absolute value of L first. So uh, I condition on I take together the case of uh, uh, of, an, of, uh, of a weight that is a little above p times n and a little below p times n, and uh, then I average uh, between them. Uh, now uh, we we can use the central limit theorem uh, to to say that uh, this L is approximately normal. Uh, the important thing is if it is approximately normal, then the probability for uh, positive L and negative L is about the same, right? Because the Gaussian distribution is, uh, is uh, symmetric. Uh, so our situation is uh, we have with probability one half, uh, we have a noise that is a little above with probability one half, we have probability, we have uh, weight that is a little Below, um, and this is and um, this is the uh, connection to uh, the robustness issue that we discussed below, because we can say that what happens now is the following. 
we have here the encoder. And now I have here either um, a channel where I add Zn with way with uh, plus L or a channel with Zn and the weight has minus L, right? And the decoder might be here or might be here. Right, so, uh, so be because we were uh, using finite block length and the weight of the noise uh, is random, has some uh, stochastic deviations, we can see this as a case of robustness. We say we, don't, we do not know if it deviates uh, upper or uh, lower. And uh, this is analogous to the case uh, where we might have a better signal to noise ratio or worse signal to noise uh, ratio. Um, so this brings us, us uh, back to uh, the negative result we mentioned before that we must lose uh, if we have two uh, signal to noise ratios, one is uh, plus epsilon and one is minus epsilon. And we're in a very similar situation uh, except for two differences. One difference is binary versus uh, Gaussian. That, that result that we mentioned was for the Gaussian case. This result now we need is for a binary case. But this is not such a big uh, issue. Um, the Gaussian bound can be extended. Uh, we did it in a very general way, but it was also done before. The more important uh, difference is that uh, these noises, if I, um, for these noises, I know the weight. So the distribution of the, uh, of the noise is, uh, uh, we say, spherical. It is uniform over all of the sequences with the same Hamming weight, where uh, the result uh, of uh, Resnick et al. was for IAD noise, which is very different. Uh, so that was the main technical challenge uh, in the work. Uh, and uh, the way and the way we uh, solved it was, you can say, a two. Uh, step uh, procedure. In one step, uh, we, we proved the bound for the case where, let's say, uh, this guy is spherical, but that guy, instead of being spherical, is this spherical plus IID, uh, IID Bernoulli, but this uh, additional IAD Bernoulli is very small because this is minus L and plus L where uh, the Ls are small. So this is still almost spherical, right? Because it's like a large spherical plus small IAD. And then the second step uh, was actually using a coupling argument to say that the difference in entropies between these uh, this combination noise and the real spherical noise is uh, very small. It's in an order that does not uh, change our result. Okay, so um, uh, so uh, in that way, we find that the optimal distortion cannot decay faster than one over square root of n. Uh, I will say that uh, if you ask what is, the, uh, what is optimal? I mean, can you get this one over square root always? The answer is that we don't know. Uh, the only thing that uh, you can say that you can always do is uh, separation. Separation has a square root of log k over k. So we still have the square root of log uh, gap between, uh, what, between the negative result and the positive. Personally, I think that the truth is with the log k, but that's just my uh, guess. Okay, so we saw that separation is a very powerful tool. Uh, this is what is done uh, almost always in practice. 
uh, we have compression schemes and communication schemes uh, that uh, work uh, separately uh, in a black box approach um, that uh, joint social encoding has uh, advantages over this separation in terms of robustness and of uh, delay, but that some of the most uh, fundamental questions in uh, joint social encoding, such as what is the best expected distortion with some uh, given block length are still open. Okay, thank you. I, I, know, I know that it was, uh, that, that, that it was a bit uh, quick. Um, I gave this talk in a couple of other places uh, but, uh, but, but the crowd was more uh, familiar with the background. So uh, I guess I, I, I should have uh, done a better work at, uh, at uh, preparing for, for the specific uh, colloquium. So I apologize for that. Um, I'll take any questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Val. Any questions? Please feel free. So I have a question maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think the real answer is uh, is uh, without the square root? Uh, no, no, I said the real, no, no, I said that the real uh, answer is this, is the square root of log k over k. So it has the, it is worse than the square root. Because yeah. uh, our analysis here was local. Uh, we compared uh, pairs of, uh, of, of, channel qualities were the, the empirical channel quality was a bit better than the mean or a bit worse than the mean. What we didn't take into account is uh, a threshold effect. So what happens uh, if with very small probability, but it might happen that the channel quality is really worse. You get here, uh, the, the weight of the sequence is not with L that is um, small, but with a large L. And um, any digital uh, scheme has to fail miserably in that case. And my guess is that uh, the joint search channel coding scheme has to have some digital element that will fail. This is the same uh, um, threshold effect of, of nonlinear uh, Nonlinear schemes, uh, uh, effect that is encountered in uh, in chaotic systems, etc. You, you have this phase transition that when the situation is really bad, then everything falls apart. And in our analysis, we we didn't we we ignored that regime. So okay. that's, that's my guess. Yeah, um, I, I, I I'm not sure that Orr agrees to the guess. No, I think it's, uh, I, I believe this is the truth as well, <laughs> at, at, least at, this, at least at this point. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. So if there are any other questions. So. Okay, Yuval, well, thank you once again. Thank you for listening. Uh, virtual thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. See you next week. We have the Robin lecture next week.